All right, so let's go ahead and just state the, um, the, the sort of formal definition of uniform convergence uh, precisely. So this is definition 24.2. Um, so, F and say sequence of real valued functions on S. Um, we say Fn converges uniformly to a function f on s provided. Um, so now I'll just uh, go ahead and re reproduce what I wrote before. So the um, for each Right, so now we just say for each epsilon greater than zero, there exists a capital N depending only on that epsilon, right? So not depending on X. Uh, there exists, exists a capital N such that for all N greater than capital N um, and for all X and S, we have absolute value of Fn of X, sorry. Absolute value of fn of x minus f f of x is less than epsilon, right? So we we've seen this before, and hopefully you're starting to get accustomed to the idea that uh, you know this is different from pointwise convergence, and the fundamental difference is that we have to be able to force all of the values of fn. Basically, by forcing n to be large, we have to be able to force all the values of fn of x for all the different x's to be close to f of x at the same time, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of like sort of not exactly terminology, but the way people use these words gets a little bit like um, not complicated, but yeah, the, the word uniform. I guess I should say, you know, as you sort of learn more and more, especially about analysis and just more and more about math in general, you'll encounter the term uniform over and over again, and it'll start to become natural to just sort of apply the adjective uniform or uniformly uh, to various phenomena, various properties, right? In, in, you know, in a way that like might not, you might not have sort of formally specified beforehand, but it'll be sort of be obvious what exactly you mean to say something that, it, you know, to say something is uniform. Like in this case, one common uh, way of phrasing this is that like, um, N can be chosen uniformly For, uh, you know, un uniformly on S, let's say, right? Uh, could be could be a way. I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways that you can kind of start to like throw around the adjective uniform. Uh, if you if you really understand, you know, what the theme is, I guess, uh, then you know you'll be able to use uh, phrases like this, and they can actually really help your thinking and your writing and your expression of your ideas. Uh, so I don't know. Well some flavor, I guess. All right, anyway, so um, I'm gonna sketch a little picture here actually, which I think also helps make the idea of uniform convergence a little bit clearer. It's similar to the one that they have in the book as well, so. All right, so here's a graph. Um, the black curve I sketched is sort of the graph of the limiting function f, and then what we have is uh, we, there's some epsilon, right? And so what we can do is we can kind of like graph f plus epsilon and f minus epsilon, which are just shifted copies of the, uh, the original graph of f. And then the idea is that, you know, if, the, if a sequence fn converges uniformly to f, then we have to be able to find capital N big enough such that for all the n bigger than capital N, the graph of fn is totally inside of this band, okay? And then 
you know, it's possible that for, you know, I mean, it's possible for some n smaller than the capital N we chose. It's possible that Fn might still be entirely within the band, but it's also possible that it might not be. So here's an example of a graph uh, of some Fn with like a small value of n where it happens that uh, it doesn't stay entirely inside of this band, okay? So that's uh, sort of a visual, <clears throat> a visual way to think about uh, uniform convergence. Maybe, you know, it might help you. Um, so let's kind of just go back and look at that example that, you know, at this point we've kind of beaten to death, uh, this example of, um, you know, F and so back to the example. F n of x is one minus absolute value of x to the n, and then f of x is this, you know, uh, zero for x in negative one one without the point zero, and then one other one, well, one one for x equals zero, right? So, um, so let's uh, let's actually kind of just like prove formally that this sequence does not converge absolutely, right? Fn does not converge absolutely. Well, um, hopefully for one thing, uh, you can accept that if Fn were to converge absolutely, F of x here, as we've written it, is the only possible limit that is the only possible thing that it could converge to absolutely, or not absolutely, sorry, what I'm saying, not absolutely, uniformly. There we go, here we go again. Okay, so Fn does not, so, so um, F of x, you know, F of x is the pointwise limit of Fn, but in general, if a sequence converges uniformly to some limiting function, then it also converges pointwise to that limiting function. And there's only one possible limiting function that you could have. So basically, if you're wondering whether a sequence converges uniformly at all to any function, you can take the pointwise limit if it exists and then show that it does not converge uniformly to that pointwise limit. That's enough to show. Um, so basically to see this, we can show fn does not converge to the given f, right? Because this statement, fn does not converge uniformly, is saying that not only does it not converge to this f of x, it doesn't converge uniformly to any f of x, right? So, but if we can just show it doesn't converge uniformly to this f of x, that automatically shows it doesn't converge uniformly to any f of x, because this f of x is the pointwise limit of fn, okay? That's what I'm trying to say. So, uh, if we just show that this doesn't converge uniformly, Well, this is a little bit misleading. We can show Fn does not converge uniformly to F, okay? So to show this, right, remember how we like negate statements about, you know, convergence and stuff, or statements that have lots of quantifiers, all the quantifiers flip to become, so like all the for alls become there exists and all the there exists become for alls. And then we flip the statement at the very end, right? So uh, in this case, what we would have is um, there exists an epsilon, so i.e. there exists an epsilon such that, you know, well, instead of saying there, instead of saying for all capital N, there exists a little n bigger than capital N, um, we can just say there exists uh, n arbitrarily large such that, um, well, and I don't know, I'll go ahead and just write, there exists, not there, so for all capital N, there exists a little n bigger than capital N such that, um, such that, uh, or sorry, and there exists an X, right? This is the real, really key part is that we only need to show there exists an X 
and there exists a little n and for no matter how big capital n is there's always a little n that's bigger and an x value where uh you know i guess yeah s s here is negative one one so let's say negative one one such that um the absolute value of fn of x minus f of x is greater than epsilon right okay so we'll take epsilon equals one half okay uh and i'll show you why in a little bit you know how we can sort of just see that um so then all we have to show is that well actually in this case we claim that actually for all n um there exists an x such that um fn of x minus f of x is greater than epsilon, right? All we have to do is like take, yeah. Um, so for example, for, yeah, let's see. Let's say greater than or equal to, because that's actually the negation. Um, so, um, in fact, take um, take uh, x equals like one minus two to the minus one over n. I think. Uh, yeah. Right. So this is clearly in negative one one then fn of x equals um, one half, right? Which is bigger than or equal to one half. So, um, so that, that actually just proves it, right? Um, one thing I want you to notice about this is like, look at, um, yeah, look at, look at the, the x that we have here, right? Uh, the value of x we're picking depends on capital N, and, or not capital N, it's depending on little n. Of course, you know, if we were doing this really like more precisely, we would be saying that for all capital N, there exists a little n. So basically uh, there would be, you know, a capital N involved somewhere, but here, because it happens to be true for all little n, we can just do that. Um, and so then we can make the choice based on little n. Uh, and, but but the choice does depend on little n, and that's because right as as n increases, more and more of the function is actually really close to zero, right? Like more and more for more and more values of x as n increases, for more and more values of x, we we actually will have that f n of x minus f of x is less than epsilon, right? Absolute value, of course. Uh, so it's like we have to keep picking like worse and worse values of x as n increases to. Uh, to make sure that you know the value of f is actually still more than one half away from epsilon or one half away from f of x. Uh, so yeah, I want to show you a picture of this process. So okay, so I drew a picture here of um, basically you know the the various fn's and then also you know the the well, okay, so we're saying that the, the limit f, right? So f of x, you know, f of x equals zero is the limit, except for like right at this point. So there's sort of like, I don't know, this. Uh, there's like a special sort of open interval here where instead of, so right, remember the picture, sorry. so like in this picture, right? I'm trying to draw this picture for our given situation. So basically the black line was uh, f of x here. Although actually here, I also used black for f1. So forgive me, but the limiting function, right? Was f of x equals zero, except right at the point x equals zero where it was supposed to be one, right? So f of x was one right at zero, but let's just ignore that for now. So f of x was zero for all the other points, right? So that means that like f of x plus epsilon is just like epsilon, okay? So this is like epsilon equals one half, right? So I drew the line corresponding to one half. 
And then we're saying that like we should be able to force Fn to just be entirely within this band down here if it was going to converge uniformly. But clearly that's not true because no matter what Fn you pick, a little piece of it always goes up to touch this point over here. And, and so what I'm saying is the argument we made basically shows that by selecting points where you know this function like each Fn ends up crossing out of this band, right? So here is the point we picked when n equals one. This is the x value we got. When n equals two, this is the x value you got. When n equals three, this is the x value. When n equals four, this is the x value, right? They get closer and closer to zero. Um, that's just because more and more of these uh, values of the functions are getting close to zero uh, when you increase n, right? So we have to force x to get closer to zero to get up here. And of course, we also would have been allowed to, instead of just picking right where it intersects like this, we could have just picked any value of x, you know, between zero and this, and that would have worked. So like any value of x that makes f2 bigger than this number works, any value that makes f3 bigger, you know, any value that makes f4 bigger and so on, that's also fine, right? But you can see from the picture that it can't converge uniformly because there's never a point at which the graphs of these functions stay entirely inside of this band down here. They always end up coming out. Uh, okay, so that's a sequence that doesn't converge uniformly. Let's just quickly look at a sequence that does converge uniformly, okay? Um, so this would be example four, I mean, whatever. Uh, doesn't really matter. So let Fn be, let, or Fn of x, one over n, sine of nx for x in r. Okay. Uh, then we claim uh, fn converges uniformly to zero. Okay. So to see this, uh, let epsilon be greater than zero, then take uh, capital N to be one over epsilon, then let little n be bigger than capital N, and let x be big, be any real number, right? Since we're claiming this convergence is uniform on all of R, uh, so we let x be any real number, then the absolute value of fn of x minus f of x, this is just zero, is just the absolute value of one over n sine of nx, which is less than or equal to uh, one over n, which is less than one over capital N, which is less than, or which equals, sorry, which equals one over one over epsilon, which is epsilon, right? So this is pretty straightforward. And if you want to sort of visualize it the same way, it's pretty easy because, you know, sine of X literally it just stays within a horizontal band of just whatever the amplitude of sine of the wave is, right? When you multiply it by something, by some amplitude. So the amplitudes are decreasing to zero, right? The amplitudes here converge to zero, oops. Right. So literally all you have to do is just control this amplitude and by controlling the amplitude, you will force sine of nx, you know, one over n sine of nx will stay within a band. Uh, and if you just make one over n smaller than epsilon, then, you know, that band will be within the epsilon band around zero, which is what we want. Okay. All right. So that's it for this video. Um, in the next video, we'll actually state and prove the main theorem, which is about, um, uniform convergence and continuity, where we'll show that if you have a sequence of continuous functions and they converge uniformly, then the limit is also continuous.